Uh, okay, your paragraph continues. As a result, we estimate that 36,936 additional in-state couples would marry, if possible, over the first three years that marriage is open to same-sex couples. Now, tell me how you derive the 39,600, uh, I'm sorry, 36,936 number. My hope is that it's the difference between the number at the end of the paragraph, 91, 51,320 couples who live in California that we estimate would marry, and the 14,384. 14, yes, it is. It, it, at least that's consistent with my math as well. I just wanted to confirm that that is, uh, that is in fact, the source of the, of the number. Now, again, the 51,320 is derived from the earlier and overstated, according to the census, estimate of the number of same-sex couples in California. If you use the 84,400 same-sex couples in California that you've used consistently elsewhere in your report, the number of projected marriages would be half of 84,400 or 42,200. And you would deduct from that the 14,384 for a figure of 27,000, correct? It's substantially lower than the number you have. Well, that might well be. I, I don't think that's necessary to do. I used the earlier study that we had already done because we have documented that in a lot of detail on our website, the Williams Institute website. And it seemed like a reasonable thing to update something that we had already done so that people could understand better how we arrived at these particular figures. But really, in the end, I, I don't think it makes very much of a difference. As I noted earlier, applying that 64% figure to California to come up with what I think is the best estimate of the number of couples who would marry is more than 51,000, which just suggests it might take another six months or a year or so to get up to this, this 51,320 figure. So it's simply a time period question, not would necessarily change the fact that there will be hundreds of millions of dollars lost in business for the state's business. So just really uh, doesn't mu much matter what number you use for the number of same-sex couples in California then, does it, Dr. Badger? Well, these things are hard to quantify, as I've said before. And in this case, it's an example of exercise where we, we did our best to put some actual numbers that we think come, excuse me, I have something in my throat, oh, thank you, that are highly, um, well, very easy to justify given what we know from the census data and from the other states and to come up with our, with our best estimate over a particular period of time. And so we think it's a good estimate for what it is. It's hundreds of millions of dollars. That's our estimate. It's, a, it's difficult to quantify very precisely, but I think we have a very, very good idea of what the order of magnitude would be. Let's turn now to paragraph 95 of your report. And um, this is where you talk about quantifying <coughs> the number of people who would come to California to get married from high California tourism states. And uh, you, uh, the paragraph cites the states of New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, North Carolina, Oregon, Texas, and Washington as hot tourism states. And you conclude that the number of individuals coming from uh, over a three-year period would be 31,120. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, the, the numbers you're using to estimate the same-sex couples in these high California tourism states also come from the ACS 2004-2006 inflated estimates, correct? That's correct, uh, that they come from those estimates, yes. Now, you, have you, um, with respect to your calculation of the same-sex couples that will come from these states, have you attempted to adjust or discount this number, or does this number reflect um, an adjustment for the same-sex couples in these states who have already gone to Massachusetts, Iowa, Connecticut, Vermont, or New Hampshire to get married? No. As I state very clearly, we did not alter these estimates beyond accounting 
for the fact that some of the out-of-state couples who got married here in California might have already come from those states. So we took an estimate of that number out of that total. Uh, you took an estimate of what out of it? Well, we tried to estimate, we tried to estimate of the roughly 3,700 out-of-state couples who had come already to California to marry, our estimate of that, we figured some of those are likely to be from those states. So we did subtract that out. As I said, thus we did not alter those estimates beyond accounting for those couples married in California prior to Proposition 8. Right, okay. Well, don't you think that a lot of the same-sex couples who, and a lot of the pent-up demand or at, at least some of the pent-up demand that was willing to travel have already gotten married, uh, same-sex couples in these states have already gotten married, and that they will continue to get married between now and the time that California does enable, through whatever means, same-sex couples to marry? Well, I think these are two separate questions, actually. One is about, did it satisfy the pent-up demand? No, I don't think it has. If our estimate is anywhere near close to correct of the 3,700 cu couples, that's a tiny blip. That's not even 1% of all same-sex couples in the United States. So I'm quite confident that that is not the pent-up demand of couples who would be willing to travel. As to whether or not during whatever time period Proposition 8 is still the law in California, whether or not some of those couples might go somewhere else, that's entirely possible. Okay, so one would not expect the same-sex couples in those states who want to marry to wait for California to offer it, if it is available elsewhere, would they? or at least not many of them. No, certainly my estimate would be different if four or five years from now, California once again let same-sex couples marry. This may be, this is a loss to California. Whether or not it's temporary or permanent might depend on whether or not the law changes. Uh, are you suggesting that the same-sex couples in these other states are going to be willing to wait four or five years to get married for California to legalize same-sex marriage? No. No, I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm simply calculating what I think the cost of Proposition 8 is to the state and to its municipality. All right, ready to move on to another subject? <laughs> <laughs> Very well, Your Honor. <clears throat> Let's turn now uh, to tab 15 in your binder. And, and Professor Badgett, this is identified as Defense Exhibit 1297. It is a Williams Project Study Policy Study <laughs> entitled Equal Rights Fiscal Responsibility, the Impact of AB 205 on California's Budget. And it indicates that you were involved in the preparation of this document. Yes, I was. I'd like to introduce this into evidence if it isn't already. No objection if it isn't already. Very well, 1297 is in if it isn't. <clears throat> I'd like to call your attention to page 7 of the document, and it's the first paragraph under Roman 3, uh, tax revenues from uh, tourism. And the first sentence reads, analysis of other states' consideration of opening marriage to same-sex couples have argued that the first state to do so would experience a wave of increased tourism that would bring millions of additional tax revenues into state coffers. Now, there has been, and one would expect, a big first mover advantage to any state that was the first, as Massachusetts was, to adopt same-sex marriage. Is that not correct? Yes, that is correct. Now, in this document, you consider three different scenarios. Do you not, in terms of projecting the non-resident individuals who will come to California in order to, in order to register domestic partnerships, correct? Yes. And your first scenario is that you call an optimistic scenario, which would um, which would estimate that uh, 64,000 couples in the western states will travel to California and spend the average three to five days stay for overnight visitors at an average of $91 per person per day. In the next paragraph, you articulate what you call a somewhat less optimistic but more realistic scenario 
assumes that the same proportion of those 64,000 Western couples will become domestic <coughs> partners as the proportion of same-sex couples in California who have registered. And you conclude using that metric that 28,160 visitors under your realistic scenario will travel to California to register domestic partnerships. And then in the next paragraph you have a highly pe pessimistic scenario is to assume that California will get the same number of couples as Vermont received. And you estimate that to be about 4,700 out-of-state couples. But you say this is likely to be way too pessimistic. Now, have you ever gone back to assess how accurate those predictions were? Yes, in a way. I, I mean, as you could see, we really were not very sure about what would happen. And things kept changing in terms of the legal landscape across the country. And things kept changing in terms of the, the status, the rights and responsibilities that went to domestic partnerships in California. So it's hard to know exactly why this happened. But it turns out, I think, that our, you know, our pessimistic scenario turned out to be the one that was closest to what actually happened. There are relatively few out-of-state couples who have registered their domestic partnerships in California. Mm -hmm. There were things, there were things, other things that changed during this time period, I think, probably significantly dampened demand for domestic partnerships in California. That would include the fact that some other states had instituted some similar types of statuses. And shortly after we published this, I believe I don't know, let me just check the date, uh, May 2003, just a few months after that, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court said that same-sex couples would be allowed to marry there. And so we may have altered people's desire or demand for a status that is clearly less than marriage. We can estimate how many have come, can we not, to register domestic partnerships? No, not exactly. We know from the state's registry, I counted them up, I think it's roughly 5% of registered same-sex partners, registered domestic partners, I'm sorry, excuse me, have addresses from outside of California. Okay, about 5%. And we also know from the document behind tab 12, uh, that is PX1263, uh, that an average, um, you'll recall, we discussed this, uh, an average of 462 domestic partnerships have been registered every month since 2005, at least as of the date of that document. And that would be roughly 17,000 or so. Uh, actually, that's uh, perhaps a little, a little on the high side. And if you take 5% uh, of that figure, you get 850 people couples that have journeyed to California in order to register their partnerships. Quite a bit lower than your pessimistic uh, estimation and way, way lower than the others as well, correct? Well, it depends on which number you look at. I mean, if you look at the total same sex or out-of-state couples who are registered domestic partners, there would be 5% would be a, a much larger number. But as I said, a lot of things change. So it's not surprising that our pessimistic scenario was even too pessimistic. But, but I think it, it makes clear that we knew that there was considerable uncertainty in making that calculation at that time. Could you now turn back to, in your expert report to paragraph uh, 33? It's on page 10, and I want to refer to your footnote 3 of that report. I'm sorry. Actually... I'm looking at the wrong thing. I'm so, sorry, yes. Footnote three reads, Massachusetts Department of Public Health has recorded 13,270 marriages by same-sex couples by the end of 2008. I adjusted for that possible surge of out-of-state couples marrying after they were allowed to wed in Massachusetts as of August 1st, 2008. And so we're talking here about the individuals who came to Massachusetts in 2008 when it was open to non-resident same-sex couples, correct? Yes. Yes, and in August of 2008, I question. I adjusted for that uh, possible surge continuing on uh, by calculating the average weddings in August through December of 2005 to 2007. Legally, these were to be in-state couples only, and subtracting that 
from the number of marriages in August through December of 2008. That difference is a reasonable estimate of the number of out-of-state couples coming to Massachusetts to marry. I'll subtract that total from 13,270 to get 12,506. Okay, so if you uh, then subtract two th two 12,506 from 13,270, you get that number that you estimate of non-resident uh, non-residents of Massachusetts coming into Massachusetts during that five-month period, correct? That's correct. And what is that number? It's roughly 700. About 764, according to my math, if it's, uh, if it's correct. And, th and so that's how many came during a five-month period and to adjust to, to try and uh, annualize that over a year. What would your rough estimate be in terms of how many non-residents would come to Massachusetts using this as the rate of the the rate of subscription? Well, I wouldn't use the data from this year to make that kind of extrapolation. The law didn't change until July of 2008. Actually, most same-sex couples like to get married in the summer, like different sex couples do. <laughs> So there wasn't much time for people from other states to, you know, to learn about the change in the law, to realize they could come to Massachusetts to make plans, to get their relatives on board, to go on a trip there, whatever they felt like they wanted to do in order to celebrate those weddings. So I don't think we would be able to really draw many conclusions from that about the longer run numbers of same-sex couples coming there to marry from other states. Well, okay, well, if you did use it though, uh, well, if you did use it. Uh, well, I wouldn't. If you did. Uh -huh. uh, so I'm asking a hypothetical. If you did, about how many would you project at that rate would come to Massachusetts over a one year period? Um, I, I would get a number that's too low. I don't know. What would 700 be by the number of months? Five months? Inflating it by seven? I don't know. Seven, twelve, something like that. It would be a higher number. It would be about... 1,800 or so? Well, you... for that particular exercise. But again, as I said, as an estimate of the number of same-sex couples who would come out of state, I don't think it would be a very good one. Okay, but then if you multiply that by three, assuming, again, by <coughs> hypothetical, that this is a useful metric to use, your calculation for the number of that, that came to Massachusetts during the first five months, it, it was possible to do so, then you get around uh, 5,500 people over a three-year period coming to Massachusetts. Professor, I want you to turn in your binder to ta uh, tab number 16, and that is marked as Defense Exhibit 742. And it appears to be a memorandum from you and your colleague, Mr. Sears, to Daniel O'Connell, Secretary of Housing and Economic Development. And I trust that that's for the state of Massachusetts, correct? That's correct. Okay, and this is dated uh, June 30th, 2008, correct? Yes. Okay, and if you'll turn to page two, unfortunately the pages are not numbered, but it's, uh, it's the actually, I think it counts to be the third page in. And it, uh, are you there? It basically has a heading number of same-sex couples who will marry. Yes. Yes, okay. Now, I want to invite your attention to the very last line on that page. It is the conclusion of a lot of analysis and calculations that preceded, but, but the sentence reads, altogether we estimate that 32,200 domestic same-sex couples would travel to Massachusetts to marry. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Okay, and that does not <coughs> compare very closely, does it? Professor Badgett, to the hypothetical I asked you to indulge based upon your calculations for the out-of-town same-sex couples who would come to Massachusetts of about 5,500 over a three-year period, does it? Well, you started with a number that I think is too low. If you multiply it by three, it's even farther away from the figure that I think would be more reasonable to, to estimate for Massachusetts. Uh, do, do you continue to believe that 32,200 is reasonable in light of your calculation of paragraph 32 of this report? We make these estimates with the best information we have at the time. 
looking at the state of the law in any given place. As we talked about a little while ago, things keep changing. And now Vermont, Connecticut, and New Hampshire, and Iowa allow same-sex couples to marry. So Massachusetts will, will and does have some competition for those couples. Uh, did those states allow same-sex couples to marry when Massachusetts opened its marriage window to out-of-town same-sex couples? No, they didn't. All right. Now, Professor Badgett, again, you, you favor legalizing same-sex marriage, correct? I have said that I think it is, based on my research, I think it's something that's good for a lot of people and doesn't hurt anyone, anyone else. That's well, correct. Would you consider or reconsider, I should say, your, your position on same-sex same -sex marriage if legalizing it would cost the government money rather than save the government money as you believe it would? My opinion is not really based on whether or not it saves government money or not. My role in doing these kinds of calculations is just to make those estimates with the best data I can find to the best of my ability. Do you know of anyone who favors same-sex marriage who would change their position if it could be demonstrated that legalizing same-sex marriage would cost the government money rather than save it money? I don't know. I have no way of knowing that. You don't, you don't, as you sit here today, you don't know of anybody who you think is in that category, category to know this? No one has ever said that to me, no. Uh, do you know of anyone who opposes same-sex marriage, who, who would change their positions based upon the fiscal implications for state and local governments of legalizing or not legalizing same-sex marriage? Again, I don't know. Are you familiar with the official ballot materials for the Proposition 8 election? I've seen the, the short summary that was on the ballot, actually, and I might have at one point looked at some of the language in the larger materials. I don't recall. Okay. Well, let me represent to you that, and it's been introduced, uh, it's in evidence, I think, plaintiff's exhibit number one, but of those official ballot materials, the state advised the voters of the fiscal impacts of Proposition 8, and it advised the voters that over the long run, this measure would likely have little impact on state or local governments. Do you agree with that? No, I don't. Okay, do you believe that the voters of California were entitled to rely upon it when they went to the polls? I don't know. My understanding is they are required to have some kind of fiscal understanding, some kind of fiscal statement. Your Honor, I don't, I don't know if this is a good time for you, but if the court would entertain a short break, I might be able to tighten things up. That's an offer I could forward. hardly refuse. Ten minutes? That would be good. Is that going to be enough? Yes, thank you. We'll take ten minutes and resume with a shortened cross-examination of the witness. Mr. Cooper. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. We, uh, Your Honor, we have another uh, witness binder we w want to hand up to the witness and to the court. We're done with the big one, Professor Badgett. Uh, may I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes, you may. Uh, thank you. Uh, Professor Badgett, I want to turn now to page 36 of your expert report and paragraph 110. Sorry, I, I put this away. Okay, I'm sorry. Wait, which page is Page 36, towards the end, uh, paragraph one, 110. And in that paragraph, you, uh, you're speaking now to the proposition that allowing same-sex couples to marry has had and will have no adverse effects on heterosexual marriage. And in paragraph 110, you say, Based on my research and experience, I believe it is unlikely that heterosexual marriages would be discouraged or made unstable if same-sex couples were allowed to marry, or, in the case of California, be permitted to continue marrying for pro uh, but for Proposition 8. For example, uh, data from the Netherlands 
the first country to allow same-sex couples to marry, suggests that heterosexual marriage uh, I'm, trends I'm not to change. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I was looking at the wrong page. I, I'm sorry. I thought you said page 36. I did say 36. It's your initial report. Okay. Maybe I. Okay. Maybe I do have paragraph. Paragraph 110. 110. Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, why don't you just go ahead and read that and catch up with me, if you will? Yes. Okay. And to conclude, uh, then, the paragraph, for example, uh, data from Netherlands, uh, the first country to allow same-sex couples to marry, suggests that heterosexual marriage trends do not change when same-sex couples are permitted to marry. Professor Badgett, uh, would you please open the binder that I've given you, the small one, to tab number one? And what I have behind tab number one is a demonstrative, Your Honor, as well as Defense Exhibit 1887, which is, um, which is a collection of statistics on the marriage rate in the Netherlands. And if, uh, with the court's permission, I would publish the demonstrative to the, to the television screen. Now, Dr. Badger, what this, what this demonstrative attempts to display is the marriage rate that is marriages per 100,000 inhabitants in the Netherlands over the course of time from 1994 to 2008. And what it reflects is a marriage rate that is relatively stable from 5.4 marriages per 1,000 inhabitants to 5.1 in 2001. That is from 1994 to 2001. And then from 2001, that is uh, 5.1 marriages per, per thousand to 4.6 marriages per thousand in 2008. And if we turn to tab two, uh, what I've submit to you, uh, we have calculated here is the average yearly rate of change in the marriage rate for the Netherlands from 1994 to 2000, the year before same-sex marriage was adopted in the Netherlands. And according to our calculations, the average yearly increase during that period was 0.02 percent. Every year, the rate increased in average with variation, obviously, between years within the period, but overall increased 0.02 percent. And if you'll turn now to tab three, the next tab is the marriage rate and the average yearly rate of change in the Netherlands for the period in which same-sex marriage was adopted and thereafter, 2001 to 2005. And you'll see the average annual rate of change now declines. It declines to 0.07% through the year that is the most recent year which we have data, 2008. Now, that is a change between those two periods, the period before same-sex marriage was adopted and the period in which and after, the year in which and after same-sex marriage was adopted in the Netherlands, a rate of uh, a, a change that is 450 percent, a decrease that that is 450 percent from the previous period. Dr. Badgett, now, notwithstanding the accepted and understood difficulties of and the various considerations and variables that go into the social phenomenon and of this kind, like the marriage rate, it is clear that at least from the time that the Netherlands adopted same-sex marriage until now, the marriage rate has declined significantly, correct? Objection. What ground? Uh, he has in the question all sorts of assumptions. I beg your pardon? Well, he has in the question all sorts of assumptions and misstatements of the statistics. Isn't that a matter you can take up on cross or redirect? It is. Uh, it's such it, a long question. It was a long question. I'll be more sympathetic to that objection, Mr. Boyes. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try to shorten it up, Your Honor. The marriage rate in the Netherlands has declined significantly since How about just marriage was asking if it has, if the rate of marriage has declined? Thank you for your friendly suggestion, Your Honor. I appreciate that. Has it, Professor Badgett, declined significantly since same-sex marriage was adopted in Netherlands? In my opinion, it has not declined significantly from the rate that we would expect, no. Okay. 
I want you to turn now to tab four. And behind tab four is a demonstrative dealing with the subject of unmarried couples with children in the Netherlands. And this is just the, essentially the raw data from every year from 1994 to 2008. And at least according to my and to our research, the only data available for, uh, on, this, uh, on this statistic is from 1994 to 2008. In other words, uh, there is no data available prior to that. And what this, what this demonstrative shows is that the numbers of unmarried couples with children have escalated steeply and consistently over time from 1994 to 2008, from 99,610 to 314,000 in 1994 to 314,566 in 2008. And the, 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 the numbers, the numbers have, again, steeply increased. Is that accurate? Well, this is ju just like the earlier slide that you showed. Uh, although the 94 stopping starting point makes a little more sense, I guess, if you can only find the data then. But yeah, we see that there was a trend of increasing, the increasing numbers of unmarried couples with children. Although, again, this is not it's not clear that, that this is right, the right measure that you would want to use. But there was, um, there was a trend before and a trend after. I think if you took that red line out there and showed it to everyone in this courtroom, nobody would be able to tell where same-sex couples got married. Well, uh, let, let, let's turn to the next tab. And, and this computes the rate of unmarried couples with children as a percent of all families in the Netherlands. And it indicates that in 1994, 1.54% 1 of all families were unmarried couples with children. But that percentage has escalated to 2008 to 4.3%. Um, 4 and in 2001, the percentage was 2.84%. So uh, the rate has, as you would expect, given the increase in the numbers, but the rate that is uh, the unmarried couples with children as a percent of all families in the Netherlands has increased significantly over the, this period of time, correct? Well, I would use the rate in an entirely different sense than you're, than you're using it here. First of all, I, don't, I have not ever calculated the statistic, and I don't know if this is you know, appropriate, accurate, or not. But just looking at this graph, again, the rate of change over the years is exactly the same. It's quite clear. It's pretty much a straight line. There was a trend of the increase before that is exactly equal to the trend of the, of the increase afterwards. So there is, no, there is no break whatsoever to suggest that anything happened of importance in 2001. Well. Well, let's look at the next tab, uh, because the yearly rate of change is calculated for the years 1994 through 2000 here. And that annual rate of change with respect to unmarried couples with children as a percentage of all family, families is uh, calculated at 0.18% yearly increase, year on year increase. If you turn to tab seven, the demonstrative behind tab seven, the average yearly rate of change is calculated for the years 2001 to 2008. And as you can see, that rate of change is 0.21% year on year. And so there has been an uptick. Again, assuming of the calculations, the math is correct, there has indeed been an uptick since 2001, an uptick that amounts to, yes, only 0.03% every year, but that that is essentially a 17 percent increase in the in the average yearly rate of change well you haven't explained to me what what this point 0 0.21 yearly increase is. is that the average increase from 2001 to 2002 and 2002 to 2003 etc cetera, etc cetera? yes yes it is well i mean these kinds of differences are very sensitive to the years that you happen to pick to start and end the calculation. So again, I, I can't comment on this without having looked more closely at the data, 
This doesn't... These rates seem odd to me, frankly. I don't know. As I said, what... I'd have to look at these. I'm seeing these particular angles on the data for the first time. Fair enough. Fair enough. Let, let's turn now to, to tab eight, uh, the demonstrative behind tab eight. And what this demonstrative displays are single parent families in the Netherlands. Just, <coughs> just the numbers, the total number of si single uh, parent families. And again, the number of single parent families since the time when the data began in the Netherlands uh, being capped 1994 to 2008, the number of single parent families has very substantially increased. Isn't that correct? Well, again, I don't know. I'd have to look at this data and see if it's correct and think about it with regard to trends longer time period probably than you've got right here. Well, accepting the time period that I'm submitting to you, and I don't ask you to agree with it, uh, uh, just to take it on its face, uh, it is clear that the number of single uh, parent families has very substantially increased over the period of time from 1994 to 2008, correct? Again, as a, me a measure of what? I don't really know exactly what, the, what this is supposed to be showing. I mean the number, the numbers that you've graphed here show an increase. And in the demonstrative behind tab number nine, this de demonstrative exhibit uh, shows single parents as a percent of all families in the Netherlands, and that percentage is displayed here conform, do they not, to the rate, or excuse me, to the, to the numbers and very substantially increased over the course of time from 1994 to 2008. Well, again, it's, you have to look at that data in the larger context of other things that are changing and earlier trends. You know, I, I don't know. I haven't seen this data before, so. And the demonstrative behind number 10, this chart displays single parents as a percent of all families and the average yearly rate of change in the Netherlands for the period before same-sex marriage was adopted of that is from 1994 to 2000, and it calculates a yearly increase in the rate of change as 0.032%, a modest increase from 1994 to 2000. And compare that to the demonstrative exhibit behind tab number 11, which displays the single parents as a percent of all families and the average earlier rate of change in the Netherlands from including 2001 to 2008. And the yearly rate of change that is calculated here is a 0.08% yearly increase, which computes to an average annual uptick in the percentage of single parents as a percentage of all families over 150%. Do you see that? Yes, although it doesn't make any sense to me to go to something that looks like 5.6% in 1964 and 6.4% in 2008, and call that 150% increase. 1994, that's the annual rate of change. Dr. Badgett, I want you to, if you will, please turn to page six of your book. Th that is the book, When Gay People Get Married. I think it's behind tab eight of the large binder, or you can certainly turn to the actual book. It's page six. Are we done with the second binder, Mr. Cooper? Uh, yes, we are, Your Honor, although I would like to move into evidence the underlying statistical data from which these demonstratives uh, were derived. It is, and perhaps I should just go uh, through them now. DIX 1887. I'm sorry, Your Honor? Under tab one of the binder, that's DIX 1887. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Boys, any objection? Your Honor, can I ask through the court just a question? Is what we have here an original copy of the original document, or is this something that's been prepared by counsel summarizing the underlying material? No, it, it is the data that you get from statistical, Statistics Netherlands. So this is just a copy from Statistics Netherlands? Yes, it is. I have no objection. Very well. DIX 1887 is admitted. And uh, DIX 2639. Where is that? That is related, Your Honor, uh, to the demonstrative behind chart number four, tab number four. 
Very well. With that representation, 2639 is also admitted. And an additional uh, defense exhibit DIX2426 is related to the data associated with the demonstrative number tab behind tab number five. Okay. All right. These are the underlying data. And you and I have got, um, I Your think, Honor. just one or two more. Uh, no, actually, I think that may be it. Your Honor, could I ask a question through the court? As I understand it, Defendant's Exhibit 2639 is supposed to be a, the backup for Demonstrative 4. Is, is that what I'm understanding? Is that correct, Mr. Cooper? Yes, yes, it is, Your Honor, I think. Well, the numbers don't match to me. Uh, demonstrative 4 has data for 1994, and I'm not seeing data for 1994 on this backup. Oh, oh right, right. Your Honor, the, the, um, as you can see from the heading of the demonstrative of the exhibit itself, size and composition, household position in the household, January 1st, so it's data as of January 1 on um, 1995 is the data that actually relates to year 1994. So they, you know, they label at least for this data that is that it is of uh, January 1 of a year, not December 31st of a previous year. I see. And if we do a little more arithmetic, 56,057 <laughs> plus 33,137 and 10,416. <laughs> Add up to 99,610. That's Is it. Is that it? That's it. And do I understand that the data for, that, the, that's labeled on 2001 here is the data for January 1 of 2002? No, it's, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question, but the data for January 1, 2001 is the data that applies to the year 2000. Well, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yes. So I think the exhibits are in that pertain to this. Very well. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, so Professor Badgett, on page six of your book, the second full paragraph, it begins with the words, what path? Do you see that? Yes. And it reads, uh, what path should change take in the United States, immediate or gradual? Do we need alternatives to marriage? Some observers want to see a more gradual expansion of rights for same-sex couples to see what the social impact will be. And now, do you agree with these observers? With respect to what? Or with respect to that statement that uh, a more gradual expansion of rights for same-sex couples should take place in order to be able to see what the social impact will be. I don't think it's necessary to wait any longer to see what the social impact. I don't think it's necessary to wait any longer to see what the social impact will be. I think we know. Do you believe that the view is a reasonable one to hold? I have reached it through a reasonable process of looking at many different sources of data in different places and those, everything that I've looked at leads me to the conclusion that there is no impact. So you, you don't believe there's a reasonable view? Is that your testimony? I don't think it's necessary in order, I don't think it's necessary for us to wait and have a more gradual expansion of rights. We have been going through that in the United States um, already, a gradual expansion of rights. Others farther right on the political spectrum, the paragraph continues, see the big changes in the United States, especially in Vermont, Massachusetts, and California, as further examples of undemocratic judicial activism foisted on an unwilling public. Now, I don't suppose you agree with that comment, do you? No. As I discuss in the book, I think that the pace of change has been quite measured. And finally, uh, some in the gay community argue that change is happening too fast to avoid political backlash and that creating alternatives to marriage, both for same-sex couples and for other family uh, forms, uh, might be a better way to go. Now, you obviously don't agree with that, right? No, I don't agree with that either. But you believe that the view is a reasonable one to hold. It's one that people offer and that we talk about. And my goal in the book was to take each of these questions that I posed in this introduction and, and to, you know, look at them from the perspective of data and reason. But you think, don't you, Professor Badgett, that 
social change with respect to same-sex marriage in this country is taking place at a sensible pace at this time with more liberal states taking the lead and providing examples that other st states might someday follow. Isn't that correct? That's the conclusion that I draw from my data on which states have made these changes. Yes. Uh, Your Honor, one moment, please. Certainly. <coughs> I have no further questions, Your Honor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Badgett. Very well. Mr. Boys, redirect. Uh, yes, thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Professor Badgett. Now, you were asked earlier whether there were some difficulties in characterization of gays and lesbians. Do you recall that? Yes. Now, are there difficulties in categorization of people based on race and religion as well? Um, like with sexual orientation, I wouldn't think of them as difficulties. I think that there are challenges, and that's why we see some changes from time to time in terms of how we measure those characteristics on surveys. Uh, could we put up the demonstrative that went from uh, 79,677 to 74,030? Uh, it was the demonstrative that you used first. Now, this is the marriage rate for the Netherlands. Yes. Now, this chart starts in 1994. Does this accurately reflect the long-term trends that you believe they exist? No. And there is quite readily available data that goes back considerably farther. Well, let me ask you to look at demonstrative exhibit 30. Can you explain what this exhibit shows? This data starts in the 1960s, and what we see is a well-known change in the marriage rate in the Netherlands, which peaked about 1970. Mm -hmm. And since then, there has been a pretty steady decline with you know, some variation from year to year. But overall, I think you can see quite clearly that there is a very clear long-term trend downward mm -hmm. of decreases in marriage rates over time. And there are some yearly variations, is that correct? Yes, there are. And for example, the marriage, uh, um, for example, the marriage rate actually goes up from 2001 to 2002, correct? That's correct. And it goes up again from 2007 to 2008, yes, correct? Yes, that's, that's right. And if you look at this chart at 1994, that is the uh, low point between the uh, sort of the uh, the valley between the two mountains, correct? Yeah, well, it might be 1995. I can't quite tell from the data, but I think if the year is sort of in the middle, it might be 95. Mm -hmm. and so either 1994 or 1995 is sort of the low point between the two high areas, correct? Yes, yes. And if they had picked a date earlier, either before 1994 or after 1994, the percentages would be quite different, correct? Well, they could very well be quite different. Certainly, if they looked before 1994, they would be quite different. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you to look again at your demonstrative number 32, which uh, we went over this morning. Now, this, of course, is from the person, the professor that had been selected as one of the defendant's experts and then later withdrawn after this report was written, in which uh, Professor Allen says, in the Netherlands, the total number of heterosexual marriages have slowly fallen since the introduction of same-sex marriage. Like most Western countries, this is, no doubt, part of the larger secular trend. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And do you agree with that? I do agree with that. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you to look at uh, Exhibit 49. Now, uh, this shows you going all the way back to 1965, the average uh, annual different sex marriage rates in the Netherlands on a five-year basis, correct? Yes. And what does that show? Well, it gets rid of a lot of the year-to-year -year variation, which makes it quite easy to see that the long-term trend is very clear. The long-term trend is towards lower marriage rates in the Netherlands. And uh, is the trend after 2001 any different than the trend immediately preceding no. 2001? No, no, not after you take out the year-to-year -year variation in this way. Mm -hmm. Now, in your book that was, uh, or, or no, actually your report that was quoted to you, you talked about uh, various trends related to marriage, and those include rates other than marriage rates, correct? Yes, that's correct. For example, do they include divorce rates? Yes. 
Well, let me show you demonstrative exhibit number 33. And this represents divorce rates in the Netherlands, 1996 to 2008, correct? Yes, that's correct. And uh, what does it show happened to divorce rates after 2001? Well, they decreased. Now, you mentioned that there was a, a conversion process that was introduced in the Netherlands that you thought needed to be taken into account in looking at the divorce rates, correct? That's right. Yes, that's an example of one of those confounding factors that we talked about before. Uh -huh. uh, let me uh, show you demonstrative exhibit 55. And this is the combined divorce and conversion rates in the Netherlands, 1990 to 2008, correct? Yes, to the best of our abilities. The statistics Netherlands does not actually provide the precise conversion figure. I'm sorry. This is the conversion figure, but these aren't necessarily all dis uh, dis disillusions. I'm sorry. But, but that's right. These are disillusions from marriages to registered partnerships in addition to divorce. That is, it includes all the conversions, but uh, you don't know how many of those conversions actually are related to disillusions. That's right. That's right. Some of them might not have been, so I'm sorry, some of them might not have uh, resulted in disillusions. So this would have increased the number of divorces and conversions artificially to some extent. And how much, you don't know. That's right. That's right, yes. Let me ask you, Professor, is this a conversion from marriage to domestic partnerships or exactly what it is? Y yes. That's what it is? Yes, yes. It's a, it's a conversion from marriage to registered partnerships because they were creating a conversion. My understanding is that they had to create a conversion process for people who were registered partners mm -hmm. who could become married. And so they decided to allow it to go in both directions. And as you understood it, uh, uh, it was conversion to domestic partnerships. Uh, was that a way of getting an easy, simple divorce? Yes, that's the way it's been used, although they no longer allow different, they, they no longer allow anyone to convert a marriage into a registered partnership. Mm -hmm. Now, let me go back to the defendant's demonstrative that we had up there before. Uh, well, we are testing our technical capability, shifting back and forth now. Um, now, the demonstrative that I want uh, is the one that showed both marriage rate and the domestic partnership rate that you showed. Uh, is it possible to do that? You had a demonstrative that, that did that before your binder. Uh, ah, now. Yes, now this uh, shows Netherlands opposite sex relationships, which include both marriage and domestic partnerships, correct? That's what it appears to show, yes. Now it shows an increase in the domestic partnerships in 2001 to 2008, and I believe you indicated there was a confounding factor that related to that, is that correct? Yes, yes. And would you explain what that is now? Well, there were two potential ones, I, I think, although I'm not positive because I had to look at this very quickly. I think they have taken out the conversion, so this would just be the new registered partnerships. Uh -huh. Although an, another thing that happened in 2001 after the law that allowed same-sex couples to marry was implemented was a second law that actually made registered partnerships much closer to marriage. They were already quite close in terms of their legal rights and responsibilities. They were virtually identical, with a couple of exceptions. And one of those exceptions was the relative ease of getting out of it. And the other was that there were no parental responsibilities attached to the registered, to the registered partner of a woman who gave birth to a child. But in 2001, they changed that so that now the partners of women who have, the registered partners of women who have children are considered to have parental authority. They have responsibilities toward the children who are born into those registered partnerships. Now, if you look at this chart, and I ask you to look at 2001, uh, from 2001 to 2002, the first year after same-sex marriage were allowed, marriages were allowed in the Netherlands, both opposite-sex marriages and opposite-sex domestic partnerships went up, correct? Yes, clearly, yes. 
Yes, and uh, now you indicated that on your direct examination that while it's useful to look at the Netherlands and other foreign countries that permitted same-sex marriages, the best evidence was to look at the states in the United States where that had happened, correct? Yes, I think so. All right, let me ask you to look at demonstrative 41, please. Now this shows the marriage rates for Massachusetts for different sex couples and the marriage rates in the United States from 2000 to 2007, correct? Yes, that's correct. Right. And uh, what does it show for the United States in terms of the marriage rate after 2004? Well, it's a pretty steady decline. There's a slight increase from 2003 to 2004, but otherwise it's going down each year. Uh -huh. And 2004 was when Massachusetts, in May 17th, permitted same-sex marriage for the first time, correct? Yes, that's correct. And uh, what, now, what does the chart show happened to the marriage rate in Massachusetts after 2004? This shows that the marriage rate actually increased. Prior to 2004, what had the marriage rates in Massachusetts been doing? Well, since 2000, you can see, well, from 2001, it's been a pretty steady decline. And the Massachusetts rates we're talking about are marriage rates just for different sex couples, correct? Yes. That's what this slide shows. Now, let me ask you to look at demonstrative 44. And uh, does this demonstrative compare? And what does this demonstrative compare? Well, this, this is looking at the change in the average annual divorce rate before and after same-sex couples could marry in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And what does it show? It shows that the divorce rate has been declining in Massachusetts and in the United States but by a larger percentage change than average before and after same-sex marriage became possible. Now, let me make sure I understand what you are saying. First, you are saying that after same-sex marriages were permitted in Massachusetts, the annual divorce rates declined, correct? Yes, yes, that's right. And then you are saying that during the same period of time, annual divorce rates declined in the United States as a whole, but not by as much, is that correct? That's right. And now I would like to direct your attention to Defendant's Exhibit 2647, which I think you have in one of those binders they handed out to you. Do okay. you have that in front of you? Yeah. Yes, I do. Tab 9 of the big binder, is that it? I think so, yes, Your Honor. Yes, oh, tab oh, 9. I'm sorry, I don't think I heard the number correctly. Uh, 2647, tab 9. Oh, yes. Now, Mr. Cooper asked you to compare the 11 months. And, uh, oh, are you having trouble there? May yes, I, just one second. <laughs> can, may I approach I'm your honor? I'm fine, I'm fine. All right. Uh, tab nine, I believe. Okay. Uh, actually, you know, I, I'm sorry, I think I have the wrong one too. Tab nine. 29. Tab uh, nine. Tonight. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. There? Okay. Mm -hmm. Tab nine. Now, uh, it is domestic partnership statistics 2000 to 2009. Yes. Okay. Now, Mr. Cooper asked you to compare the first 11 months of 2009 to the first 11 months of 2008. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. And he suggested that those two periods were completely comparable, despite the fact that same-sex marriage was allowed in 2008, but not in 2009, correct? He did. Now, in fact, same-sex marriage was only allowed for five or six months in 2008, correct? Yes. And if you, um, if you take just the months that same-sex marriage was allowed in 2009 and compare it with the same five months or, or, or five or six months in 2009, the difference is considerably greater, correct? It looks like it would be, yes. Mm -hmm. and yeah, yes, although, as I think I mentioned before, I, I think that it's, it's hard to draw any conclusions from a status that's been around for nine years at that point. Mm -hmm. But that's right. When same-sex couples had no choice, we do see a higher, we see higher numbers. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, he also asked you to look uh, at your report at paragraph 91. Can you put that in front of you, please? Yes. And he asked you a lot of questions about the calculations of exactly how many thousands of Californians same-sex couples would marry if they were allowed to. Do you recall that? 
Yes, I do. Now, for the point that you are making, does it make any difference whether the number of same-sex couples that are being deprived of the right to marry is 30,000 or 40,000 or 50,000? No, no, there's still an enormous economic harm to those couples as well as to the state. Now, let me go to your demonstrative exhibit 12. And what does this demonstrative show? Well, again, this is the our estimate of the numbers of couples who got married in those six months and compares it to the number of couples registering domestic partnerships in roughly that same time period. And it shows approximately 18,000 same-sex couples chose marriage and about 2,000 same-sex couples during the same period of time chose domestic partnerships, correct? That's right. And what does that tell you about the preference of same-sex couples for marriage over domestic partnerships? Well, like some other comparisons we made, I, I think that shows that same-sex couples prefer marriage by a wide margin over domestic partnerships. Now, let me ask you to look at demonstrative 13. Now, what does this demonstrative show? Um, this shows shows very clearly the same point. It shows that marriage is preferred for same-sex couples over either civil unions or domestic partnerships then. As I said, in the comparison with California, the early version of domestic partnership was even less popular among same-sex couples. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you to look at your report, paragraph 40. Now, Mr. Cooper read, or, or rather asked you to read various portions of this paragraph 40. Do you recall that? Yes. Would you read paragraph 41 for context, please? Okay. In other words, allowing same-sex couples to marry would result in a near-term increase of roughly 7,700 non-registered domestic partners residing in California who would benefit from the economic protections afforded by marriage, or 9% of the same-sex couples living in California. Now, would you please turn to paragraph 37 of your report? And Mr. Cooper read and asked you to read various portions of paragraph 37. For context, would you read paragraph 38, please? Whereas getting married sends a message that is recognized by almost all individuals in a culture, the same-sex couple suggested in interviews that an alternative status is often understood to have a different and inferior meaning than marriage. Some of the couples saw registered partnership as lacking the deep emotional meaning of marriage, and they tend to see registered partnership as dry and businesslike. In contrast to registered partnership, a new status that was created in 1998, part of the value of marriage is the clearly recognized signal that it sends. According to one former Californian who was living in the Netherlands with her partner, a Dutch citizen, quote, one of the amazing things about marriage is people understand it. You know, two-year-olds understand it. It's a social context and everyone knows what it means, end quote. Her partner noted that marriage, quote, has substance that registered partnerships lacked, the ability to show, as she put it, quote, this is the woman that I have chosen to be with for the rest of my life, end quote. And what is the significance of that in your analysis? In my opinion, it clearly shows that individuals clearly not only see marriage as something that's more valuable that comes with added characteristics over some alternative status, but that the alternative status in and of itself is devalued because it's seen as sending a message of inferiority. Now let me ask you to look at the small binder that was given to you with the demonstratives, and I'm going to to the demonstrative that's at tab four. And maybe we can put that up on the screen, please. Now, Mr. Cooper asked you some questions about this. And there's a portion of this chart that says this is a 215.8% increase. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And this purports to show that uh, the unmarried couples with the children in the Netherlands. Now. When was same-sex marriage authorized in the Netherlands? As of April 2001. 
April 2001. Now, since it takes uh, about nine months at least to produce a baby, even if you start immediately, uh, can we agree that it is unlikely that there were any children born to unmarried couples as a result of the passage of gay marriage prior to 2002? That sounds quite plausible to me. Now, I apologize for doing this, but we didn't have these charts before, and I'm going to ask you to do a little bit of arithmetic uh, with me so uh, I understand. Okay. All right. Now, if you look at the change, the increase in unmarried couples with children from 1999 to 2001. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And uh, that's an increase of roughly uh, 34 and a half, uh, 30, 34, 35,000, correct? Yeah, that's about right, roughly. And uh, now in that period after 2002, is there any comparable period that had a comparable increase? I don't see any that comes close to that, no. For example, from 2002 to 2004, the increase was about 32,000, is that correct? 2002 to 2004, over a two-year period. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I was only looking at one-year periods. Yes, that's yes, that's a smaller increase, I believe. Right. Yeah. And uh, each of the subsequent years actually are smaller than that, correct? Well, it looks like it. They come very close. This is about as close to a straight line as you will ever see in a demographic measure. Now, does this tell you anything at all about the effects of allowing gay marriage, encouraging people to have uh, unmarried couples to have children? It certainly provides no evidence whatsoever for it, in my opinion. Now, if you look at the next demonstrative, the one that's behind tab five, this shows that unmarried, this shows the unmarried couples with children as a percentage of all families. You yes. see that? Yes, I see it. Uh-huh. And from 2000 to 2001, the percentage increased by 0.24 percent, correct? Yes, yes. And from 2001 to 2002, it was 0.22 percent, correct? That looks right. Now, after 2002, is there any year where it increases by that magnitude, that is by uh, 0.22 or 0.24? Or 0.22 or 0.24, somewhere in between from... 03 to 04, it looks like. And I believe in the other years, it's less than that. Mm -hmm. Now, do you draw from this the conclusion that uh, allowing same-sex marriage reduced the number of unmarried couples with children as a percentage of all families? That reduced it? No, I wouldn't conclude that at all either. Well, what can you, if anything, conclude from this? I think you can conclude that the trend that existed before 2001 continued after 2001 with virtually no departure from the trend, no departure that I can deduct of any meaningful size. Now, do any of the questions that Mr. Cooper asked you go at all to the issue of whether gay and lesbian couples are substantially hurt by not being able to marry? In terms of these figures here or in terms of the entire discussion? No, the entire examination. Is there anything? Is there anything that he said that he covered or showed you during the entire examination, not just looking at these charts, that is in any way inconsistent with your conclusion that gay and lesbian couples are substantially hurt by not being able to marry? No. No, I have not changed my opinion based on this discussion. Uh, was there anything that he showed you or discussed with you during any part of the examination that was in any way inconsistent with your conclusion that gay and lesbian couples, children, that is, children being raised by gay and lesbian couples, are hurt by their parents not being allowed to get married? No. No, I don't think we discussed that at all. So, no, my opinion has not changed. I still think they would be hurt by their parents not being allowed to marry. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you saw or heard at all during Mr. Cooper's examination that is in any way inconsistent with your conclusion that gay and lesbian couples' right to marry would not cause any harm to heterosexual couples or to the institution of marriage? No. I still have seen no evidence that suggests that there would be any harm or any change to the institution of marriage. Thank you. Your Honor, I have no more questions. Very well.
Thank you, Professor, for your testimony. You may step down. And regrettably, counsel, we are going to have to adjourn this time for the day. I have a judge's meeting I need to preside at, and I don't want to disappoint my colleagues. So we will resume tomorrow morning at 830 and let's see, our next witness is going to be? Our next witness will be Mr. Ryan Kendall, but uh, we are also going to be playing excerpts from a deposition of a couple of witnesses. All right, fine. Anything to take up? No, Your Honor. See you tomorrow. Thank you, Your Honor.